Hello, this is Gary Marr of Glenrock Community College. This screencast is for my CS 150AB Summer 17 Online students, and it covers topics in Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is when we're going to really talk mostly about creating GUI applications, which we started about, started a little bit on in Chapter 10. We're going to kind of complete the process in this particular chapter, but I will tell you that. Uh, this is not going to be a class that gets too far into GUI applications. I mean, most, most, for the most part, this class is language neutral. And even though we have introduced Python, we have not introduced anything with GUI programming. There's some examples of GUI programming in Python. And um, some of the examples I'm going to show you in this PowerPoint is from Visual Studio. But this is not something we have time to really cover. What I really want to talk about is how we're going to use that logic that you created in the first 10 chapters inside a GUI application. So one of the things, and the other thing we're going to talk about too, is what my expectations are for the final assignment, assignment 10. And this might be a good place to start. On this particular slide, what I've got is the main window or the main frame. And on here I have some different widgets or GUI controls. What I'm going to have you do in your application or your assignment is develop an application. You're going to choose the GUI controls you'd like to have. And you can do this in Visio or if you know Visual Basic or Visual Studio or Java or JavaScript or Python. You can use that, but Visio has all these controls also. And I want you to lay out the screen in a storyboard. And we talked about storyboard at the end of chapter 11, excuse me, 10. And above each one, I want you to put a little circle or a balloon diagram telling me what the name of that particular widget or screen GUI is going to be. So for example, I've got menus, I've got text boxes, I've got some uh, label boxes which are uneditable text, and this is something that will be part of the deliverable for assignment 10. Okay, And the other part we'll talk about later. Definitions. GUI controls or widgets are things like text boxes, radio buttons, check boxes, list boxes, combo boxes, uh, command buttons. They have properties. The properties are whatever text is printed on them, what color they are, what font is used, how big they are, if they have a border, those kinds of things. And of course, it's going to vary based on the control that you're using. Those controls also have methods and functions, which are part of their normal activity. And again, we can't get too far in that. They have events, which we talked about in the last chapter. So, you know, the classic command button has a click event. But also, all of these controls essentially are classes that are part of namespaces that you're importing when you're creating your GUI design. Now, if I was doing this in Python, I would do it kind of old school. It would be a series of programming statements, much like we create pseudocode now for our console applications. But more sophisticated IDEs, um, integrated development environments like Visual Studio or um, NetBeans, um, uh, Aptana, Eclipse, have the capability of linking into those classes and they typically have some sort of graphics or toolbox where you can take those graphics which represent a text box or represent a command button. You can drag them to a frame or a window to create your storyboard interactively. The fact that some IDEs have this graphical um, capability to design the screens interactively almost like playing a video game is a real plus because the old school way of developing them via statements and you can see an example of this if you look into the uh, different um, samples I put out there in the canvas files if you look at some of the Python programs like the calculator program you can see how many lines of code are necessary to put all those controls and, 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 and import those classes in your application. It's much simpler with some of the more sophisticated IDEs, again, like Eclipse or Visual Studio. This is the uh, Visual Studio IDE. And as I mentioned before, this is typically a part of this is a toolbox. This window over here is using, used for setting the properties of the control which is in focus. There's only one control and focus here, so all of this information here portrays the different characteristics or attributes of this particular screen widget or screen control. The reason, the way we want to look at this also is this is simply a class file. This particular button object is used many, many times or could be used many, many times on our main window here, but each one of its instances would be slightly different by its properties the events we programmed to it, and then what those events should do if clicked. I might have one button that says help. I might have one button that says exit. Obviously, they're both button classes. 
they'll have pretty much the same attributes except text. One would say help, one would say exit. They would have um, different click events. And inside the click event was where the real variability would occur. And that would be for help, might be a, another window popping up with some instructions on what to do next. Whereas exit, when that's clicked on, your logic might come up and say, are you sure? Yes, no, to give you kind of a, um, a safety, if you will. So you didn't have to exit the application too soon. Typically with GUI program, there's design time and runtime. This is especially true of the Microsoft products. Design time is when you're working inside the IDE. You just saw the IDE, and from that IDE, as with other IDEs, like Thony and some other things that we've, um, we could have with different languages, the IDE will typically let you design the code, program the properties, the events, the methods, the attributes, string it all together in an application, and then run and test it. You typically will have a debugger built in that lets you help you find logic errors. And then finally, when you're fairly confident the program is tested and ready to go, you'll create a runtime version. The runtime version really just is the application running. I mean, obviously, someone who had to look at a IDE like this to run a program would generally be confused. All we want them to see is the runtime version, which is this window running with the buttons and the text boxes and the radio buttons. This is a good example of some of the options that are available with Windows and Visual Studio. Um, some of the controls here are fairly new, like context menu and tab controls. Typically what happens is the very first uh, Visual Basic programming or Windows, or excuse me, Visual Studio programs had only a few controls, text boxes, combo boxes, list boxes, label boxes. And then as the, the operating system grew, and had more functions graphically, those typically were made available through the Visual Studio product line. So things like you know, right-clicking on a screen, having a, a sub-menu appear. That was something that didn't happen right away. It took a couple different generations of Windows, and therefore it took a couple different generations of Visual Studio to show up. But here's some of the, the fairly con, uh, consistent controls you'll see today in Windows or even in environments like uh, uh, Java or JavaScript. Uh, very small type here. <laughs> I'll let you read this over. There is a fair amount of information in the textbook, and this is reflected in these controls, where or these these uh, slides here, where it's talking about the specific controls. Uh, classic case uh, or classic uh, reason for doing this might be as such: if I had a pizza place and I was taking pizza orders on the screen, I could. Um, show the different options for pizza toppings as a checkbox or a radio button because both of them would let me indicate whether or not the pizza was going to have cheese, pepperoni, anchovies, peppers, sausage, whatever. The problem is, is there's a difference between the radio button and the checkbox. The radio button is mutually exclusive, which means that inside that grouping only one option can be selected. So radio buttons are more appropriate for things like gender, male, female, size, small, medium, large, where only one option is typically feasible. Whereas check boxes is a great thing for pizza because I might have pizza with just cheese. I might have pizza with cheese and sausage. I might have pizza with cheese and, and peppers. Um, and I could have as many check boxes selected as I had toppings or re required toppings for that pizza. Whereas the radio buttons, mutually exclusive, only one option could be taken. Another example of how controls can be different would be a label box and a text box. A text box is typically something you can type into, which shows text. It's editable text. You can go back and change it. A label box also displays text, but a label box is not editable text. It just sits there. You can't even go to it, or even if you could tab to it, you couldn't change it. So therefore, you might use a text box for, any, for um, taking information from a user, whereas you might want a calculated answer to be in a label box where the user couldn't somehow change it, make it look differently. So what this, these two slides here do is kind of summarize what the major controls that you're going to find in most GUI applications are. And these are pretty primitive. They've got a lot more sophisticated uh, since the original control is available with Visual Studio um, 1.0, but it will give you some idea. This particular one's interesting because this is actually a Python um, GUI application. This is called Calculator. It's one of the sample files. And what I've done here is I've shown, again, the name of the controls. Okay, I've positioned them across this frame. This happens to be kind of squeezed in. I didn't have a lot of extra space in it. It's got two text boxes, a button, and a label box to display an error message if one occurs. Okay, It's got a click event. Uh, well, it's got a click event. It 
uh, I'm not sure if this one had a mouse hover, but mouse hover is if you position the mouse over top of something, it gives you information. Uh, and then it doesn't have resize or drag or drop. I think they were just put up there because those are options that you could have added if they're appropriate. They may not be appropriate for this example. You can see Calculator 1, the several different versions of the Calculator program out in the samples if you want to run them in Python. And if you look at the code of that, you'll see what's involved with describing that environment, which is this you know, window with these controls, storing those initial values, and then any events that are happening. It's got one event. It's a click event on the Calculator button, how that works. Visual Studio, Eclipse, NetBeans makes it much easier because it takes some of the, the drudgery work out of your hands. It kind of does it for you. But the problem when things do it for you is sometimes they can do them differently than what you've liked. You lose a little control. Whereas if you're using something like Python where you have to put a line of code for everything you want that application to do and how it should look, you probably have got a lot better control. But it's, it's going to be very labor intensive. It takes a lot longer. Uh, again, I guess the, the, the thing that I want to leave you here is that um, it's, I'm, trying to do, I'm trying to make some, some kind of uh, comparisons, or I'm trying to actually extend pseudocode to, how, to somehow include things like event processing, which pseudocode really doesn't do very well. But I've got some events that I've, I've pretty much tried to plug in here. And I guess what I'm saying here, and again, pseudocode anything goes, is when the click event happens, I'm going to call this routine call add numbers. Well, add numbers could have been taken from something we did five or six weeks ago. It's a very standard pseudocode block of code. It's just logic that executes line after line. But the way it was triggered was from a GUI interface with a window called frame, with a couple of text boxes, a calculate button, Okay, a answer is zero, and this pretty much equals what I had in the previous screen. This would be kind of a super pseudocode representation of that Python calculator program. And then I'm saying here that I'm going to have an event on calc, which is the name of the button. And if that, while I'm listening for this, if that happens, I want it to call a routine called add numbers. Okay. Storyboard. I just made my storyboard a lot more complicated than one last time. And this is what I want you to do for assignment 10, is I want your storyboard to be laid out so that all the controls are on there. You can use Visio, you can use any drawing program you want. You can use Lucidchart, um, you can use Excel, you PowerPoint, anything that draws boxes and lets you put text in there. I want you to identify all the controls that are on that storyboard so that each one of them has a name and can be referenced uh, accordingly. Um, you're going to probably want to use some sort of prefix. This is kind of a prefix that's called reverse Hungarian notation from Visual Basic, where your labels have a prefix of LBL, your text boxes have TXT, your buttons have BTN. That makes the code a little easier to follow because these particular definitions you're creating in the storyboard are going to show up in your pseudocode later on. Um, let's see. Vocabulary in terms. Um, Again, this is stuff that's just covered inside the textbook. Um, what I will do is uh, look at the examples given in the textbook, and I will also probably do a short video on this, that talks about how to create the object dictionary. The object dictionary is critical. So what it does, it takes that storyboard slide that you've done, and it says, okay, here's all my controls. Here are the properties that I want them to have, like a name and a button or maybe a, a label, uh, what the text is going to be. And then if it has an event, what the event is, and then what module block it's going to call if that event is triggered. And there's examples out there inside the Canvas files that will be helpful, and I'll also try to do a short video on it also. Hope that helps. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you.